Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the final week of our ISA season event. Um, I hope you all managed to survive the, uh, the shock of the move to, the, to move to summertime uh, over the weekend. Um, and today we have uh, again a slightly different uh, talk from Matt Parkinson. So Matt is uh, the manager at Waverton, a company joined in August 2019. He's a fund manager in the multi-asset team, working on the multi-asset and alternative funds at the company. He's also a key member of the team managing the award-winning Waverton Managed Portfolio Service. In addition, Matt contributes to the firm-wide asset allocation committee. Uh, prior to joining Waverton, Matt worked at Janice Henderson Investors as a multi-asset analyst. He graduated from Loughborough University in 2015 with a degree in psychology and holds the investment management sticker and is a CFA chart holder. And on top of that, he was chosen as a CityWare top 30 under 30 uh, in 2021. So quite the CV that got there. Uh, so much, David. Quite, quite an intro. Couldn't, couldn't have done that better myself. <laughs> yeah. So today, Matt is going to be talking, uh, as you can see, about the role alternatives play in a well-structured portfolio. Um, as is the norm, we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. Um, so please do, as we, as we go along, um, pop any questions you have in, in the box on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, we, should, we should have a good amount of time at the end to answer questions. Um, so yeah, I'll hand over to you, Matt. Thanks very much. Thanks, David. Um, firstly, guys, thank you all uh, very much for taking the time to listen in to me today. And hopefully over the next 20 minutes or so, I plan to kind of lay out the case why alternatives should uh, and will likely play a vital role in well-structured portfolios going forward and kind of provide some insight into how we view and use alternatives in multi-asset portfolios at Waverton. So firstly, I'm just going to touch on the kind of market backdrop. And it's going to be a bit of a history lesson embedded within this presentation as well. So as I'm sure you're aware, a kind of traditional portfolio for kind of medium risk clients has been the classic 60-40 portfolio. So around 60% exposure to equities and 40% exposure to your kind of fixed income government um, security exposure. So now, as you can see from this chart, which I pulled from a presentation deck we were actually using back in 2021, from up until from 1994 up until 2021, so the last 25 years or so, this has been pretty much exactly the portfolio we wanted. But let me stress, this is kind of up until 2021, because obviously 2022 was quite a catastrophic year. Now, as you can see from this kind of chart, it's compounded at an incredibly impressive rate. And that's partially due to the negative correlation between equities and bonds, i.e., when your equities are performing poorly, your government bonds um, have been performing really well, really kind of saving the day and limiting that drawdown. But now, if you actually look at that bond performance, bonds haven't only performed when your risk assets have been performing poorly. In fact, government bonds have been a pretty fantastic investment uh, at any time over the last 25 years or so. And we tend to think investors have missed quite how good these returns have actually been, which have really demonstrated in this chart. You can see here the bottom line on, on this chart here shows the Japanese government bonds have returned 3.6% per annum since, 18, uh, since 1985 to 2021, which isn't too bad for what is meant to be your risk-free asset. US government bonds over the same time have returned 6.1%. Just above this, you can see developed market equity index has returned 6.7%, but note with significantly more volatility, lowering that risk adjusted return. However, what takes many people by surprise is the best government bond investment, which has actually outperformed equities, has been the UK gilt, which over that same time period up until 2021 has actually returned you 7.9% per annum. Now, as I said earlier, this really was up until 2021 and the party really did stop in 2022 when we saw the kind of bursting of what old Jeremy Grantham called the everything bubble and really for qu quite good reason. 
over 2022, we saw significant declines in equities, but more surprisingly, at the same time, we saw significant declines in government bonds. Now, this scatter graph here shows you the annual returns of fixed income and equities in every given year between 1872 and uh, every year between 1872 and up to 2022. And that dot on the far bottom left is 2022, which really shows the severity of the negative returns we all face as investors over 2022 alone. We actually saw the largest annual period sell-off in fixed income since the data started, whilst also being accompanied by a material double-digit decline in equities. Now, this sell-off in equities and bonds at the same time caught a lot of investors off guard. And that's really because over the last 20 years, the rolling correlation between equities and bonds has been consistently negative. As demonstrated by this chart, it's never got and never breached that positive territory, breached into positive territory going all the way back to 2002. However, for the kind of students of history, this may not have come as such a surprise. Because this is that same chart, but again, using that same data set I showed you earlier, going back to 1876, um, all the way up to 2022. And the orange circle you can see on this chart here highlights the time period I displayed on the previous chart. And as you can see, that kind of period of consistently negative and stable correlation over the last 25 years was actually the outlier over the longer term. And the relationship between equities and bonds is much more volatile than the current last 25 years would suggest. And that's something all kind of multi-asset investors should be well aware of, um, particularly going forward. Now, one of the reasons why this relationship has been so stable over the last 25 years, in our opinion, is because inflation has really only trended downwards since the uh, 1980s. And that's been accompanied by a trend with down in rates. But now that's actually changed. And this chart here is to kind of highlight the equity bond correlation and its relationship with inflation. In kind of short, it shows that historically, average three year core CPI goes above that 2.5%, which is that kind of yellowy green line there. The equity bond correlation turns positive. Now, for much of the past 20 years, we've been in that bottom quartile where you see all the dots are. When bonds negatively correlated equities, which results in bonds offsetting the weakness in equity markets and smoothing that return profile for investors. However, over 2022, up until the present day, we passed that vital core CPI 2.5% line where historically that bond equity correlation has turned positive. And lo and behold, in 2022, we saw that negative correlation break down. Now, this leaves us with significant diversification problems for portfolios, especially if you have the view inflation is going to be structurally higher going forward. Now, I just also want to highlight the additional risk that we've seen within the bond market, which has really been driven by the low level of yields we've seen over the last decade, has been increasingly evident over the last kind of decade or so. And this chart just shows that there's actually been nine double digit drawdowns from the US long bond over the last 10 years, each of which tended to be of a larger in magnitude, which really highlights there is quite significant amounts of risk in supposedly your risk free assets now. So then that leaves us with a question of kind of how do we overcome this diversification problem? And our answer at Waverton is to have a significant allocation to alternative investments. Now, we've actually been underweight fixed income and overweight alternatives since around 2017, when we first thought fixed income started to look in kind of pretty vulnerable from a valuation perspective. Arguably, this may well have been too early, but it did leave us in good stead over 2022. We've actually subsequently tactically moved back to a neutral weight in fixed income on the expectation of kind of slowing growth over 23, but still believe that given the higher inflationary backdrop, that alternative should have a meaningful allocation in portfolios. So as I'm kind of 
sure you're aware the alternative universe is huge and covers a whole range of investments with kind of different risk and return characteristics. So at Waverton, we try to break it down into two key solutions. The first one, absolute return alternatives. Now, within this allocation, we really are looking for diversifying strategies, which we believe should protect capital in weak markets, as they have limited correlation to risk assets, but importantly, also the real economy. We really are trying to replicate here that portfolio cushion element of fixed income to help investors smooth that return profile that we think is going to be vulnerable in the future. And then we have our second key solution is real asset alternatives. Now, real asset allocation is our long only return seeking alternative exposure. As I showed earlier, multi asset portfolios have had significant contribution to return from fixed income, especially if you're a UK government bond investor, which has compounded at 7.9% for 20 years. Now, we think that return is very unlikely to be repeated over the medium term, leaving investors very likely to be disappointed by aggregate portfolio returns. So within the real asset allocation, we really are seeking to deliver a return akin to this over the longer term. And we define real asset investments as investments underpinned by a physical asset. They often have inflation linked cash flow streams, which are then able to deliver positive real returns over the medium to long term. Now, having a look at these in a bit more detail, absolute return first. So within the absolute return solution or portion of our alternative allocation, we really are trying to seek a positive return on any 12 month rolling basis, despite what's happening with risk assets and fixed income. We really are looking to achieve a cash plus return with limited correlation to both fixed income or equities. So for absolute return investments, we're looking for three key things. Firstly, low volatility for the majority of investments. And where there is volatility of in the investment, it must not be highly correlated with risk assets. Second point, limited correlation. Again, we do not want to be fixing the issue of correlation or diversification with yet again another correlated asset. And finally, low cost. We have a low return investment, which should be expected given the lower levels of the risk being taken. Costs become an increasingly important consideration as these costs have the ability to eat into a larger portion of your return. So we structure our absolute return kind of solution into three distinct buckets. The first bucket, specialist short dated fixed income. These are low duration, high grade credit with very limited duration or spread risk fixed income investments. Secondly, absolute return strategies. These are your kind of macro hedge funds such as BH Macro, successful long, long short strategies, or your kind of trend following CTA managed futures funds. And finally, structured opportunities. These are kind of risk premium strategies, which were really only kind of historically accessible via hedge funds, but are now more widely open to the market. And these really allow you to harvest structural risk premium uh, with limited correlation to risk assets, as they're really typically driven by kind of idiosyncratic opportunities or kind of non-economic um, market participants. An example, good example being of a absolute return investors is, is this fund, which is held within our absolute return fund. Now this is a Dunn Managed Futures Fund. It's one of the original CTA funds and it is use it's eligible. And it fits perfectly into that absolute return fund um, bucket. The funds actually show negative correlation to equity markets consistently through periods of acute market stress, which is exactly when you need the fund to perform, when your equity investments are seriously not working. But it's also actually managed to provide a broadly positive returns during more benign market periods. You can just see here on this chart, the funds actually had positive performance during the 1987 crisis, Black Monday, the tech bubble, the GFC, COVID, and to the Ukraine invasion. Now, two, two more quick examples, um, which actually fit in our structured opportunities bucket within the Waverton Absolute Return Fund. Now, the first one at the top, the NASDAQ volatility note, 
This is really designed to take advantage of the passive flows from ETFs and importantly leveraged ETFs and bank hedging programs within in, on, on the NASDAQ. These flows and kind of bank hedging programs result in intraday trends within the NASDAQ being particularly strong and especially at the close when the market is moving aggressively up or down. The strategy is designed to take advantage of this by building into the directional trend of the day and positioning itself to reverse overnight and has historically performed exceptionally well during extreme market moves. And now the second strategy is a uh, long US rates volatility out of the 20 year mark on the curve, which is distorted by hedging activity, primarily from Asia actually. Now this actually means the strategy can go long rates volatility, but because the volatility curve is actually inverted, i.e. in backwardation, it does not bleed like a usual long volatility position and it actually carries positively during non-volatile periods. So you've got volatility exposure, which doesn't cost significant amounts to carry. And we think it's a great strategy within fixed income as a fixed income replacement. Now on to kind of real assets. So first of all, what do we define? There we go. First of all, what do we define uh, real assets? So at Waverton, we kind of deem real assets investments as investments, as I said earlier, really underpinned by a physical asset. They typically have inflation linked cash flow streams, and we believe they'll provide a real total return over the long term. Now, we bucket them into five broad real asset classes. First of all, property, infrastructure, asset finance, commodities, and specialist lending, each of which we actually believe have their own risk return characteristics and that are opportunistically should be added to in different times during the cycle. So what do we really think we can achieve from this real asset allocation? So we actually believe real assets over the longer term can achieve a CPI plus four type return. So almost an equity like return, but on two thirds the volatility of equity. So we're really targeting a kind of 10 to 12% volatility range versus equities around that kind of 15 to 16% mark. But we expect to achieve this return profile across the cycle. There will certainly be specific periods uh, where this increases, especially if you're investing via kind of an investment trust wrapper, such as kind of Q1 2020 and September 2022, where we saw dis discounts to NAVs blow out significantly, very wide. But we actually think these should be viewed as an opportunity. And it's also why they need to be viewed as long term investments. They provide an attractive yield of around kind of four to five percent. And then you just kind of really need to let the compounding do its do its job, particularly when there's inflation in cash flows, which kind of compound in each other and build that NAV and income profile up. So what do we believe real asset investments offer? Really return seeking alternative exposure, providing some diversification away from your traditional equities and fixed income. You do this by accessing different risk premia, whether it be illiquidity, complexity, term premia, and really avoiding those high beta and duration investments. Hope that the return on offer is in significantly in excess of inflation and really should come from capital growth as well as income. Now, remember, this is our return seeking allocation. We're really trying to fill that void that's going to be left due to the limited return potential left from your traditional investments, in particular fixed income as that 7.9% annual return from the UK guilt is very unlikely to be kind of repeated over the next five to 10 years. Now, you don't just have to take our word for it, that this is kind of actually achievable. Now, this data here um, on the chart is uh, taken from the BlackRock Capital Markets um, Assumptions data, which is publicly available. And it highlights the expected return and volatility of various equities, bonds, and real asset sub um, investments uh, across, the, across the universe. And as you can see there in that kind of fixed income gray dot on the bottom left, the return potential going for forward for a fixed income is incredibly constrained. Whereas the real assets in that blue circle uh, for a similar amount of volatility, the return is in excess of fixed income and actually in line with equities in some cases. The equity return is still impressive over the longer term, but comes with significantly amounts of expected volatility. And finally, one good example of a kind of 
investment uh, within real assets is uh, Victory Hill Sustainable Global Sustainable Energies Opportunities Trust. Now, this is an investment trust listed on the LSE within the infrastructure segment of real assets is how we classify it. Now, the trust is designed to provide vital infrastructure to support the energy transition. The company really focus on investing in mid market infrastructure deals and to kind of work alongside experienced development and operating partners who really drive the growth in the asset. And what we really like their model is that they don't just let the developers fully exit the project. They ensure that they remain invested within the equity alongside the trust. So this continue to be aligned with making sure the develop the development of the asset and the operation of the asset is done to its best ability. They really are targeting a 10% return, and that is partially driven by the long-term inflation-linked cash flows uh, with stable and strong counterparties. Um, whilst they're also actually addressing key energy concerns, so it has a social benefit, whether it be with regards to climate change, energy access, and energy um, efficiency. So that kind of kind of sums up the um, presentation side of things. So now happy to take any questions on alternatives. Um, over to you, really, David. Great. Yeah, thanks very much for that, Matt. It was all very, uh, all very interesting. So we have a few questions. Um, so one is on whether you see any um, new areas in real assets. So, I think they mean like digital assets, things like that. Yeah, so I think that I think the real assets kind of allocation is continuously evolving, and we constantly see new opportunities. I do think within digital assets, there's kind of a huge growth that's required to support the digital transition that we're kind of undergoing right now. Obviously, over the last two years, we've seen. Um, two digital assets, infrastructure trust launch, and there's also free eye infrastructure, which is one of the investments we hold within our own real assets fund, which is increasing its exposure to digital assets within that, but that's kind of more broad economic infrastructure assets. Uh, but there's this, yeah, Cordian uh, digital infrastructure within the UK listed in the LSE and uh, D9 um, infrastructure investment assets both of which are really building into that theme and growth going forward. They're taking two different models approaches where we've got Cordian, which is much more of a cash yielding assets, um, telecom networks, towers, and then there's D9, which are in much more growthier assets, which need more capital to support them, but arguably have a longer term growth runway. So Desm, we're certainly seeing kind of the real assets universe continuously expand um, and think there'll be ample opportunities go going forward. Okay. Um, another one is: Are you able to talk about what the Waverton view on inflation is at all? Yeah. No. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. So, inflation is is certainly a, a tricky one. And if I could pinpoint it exactly, you could probably uh, pretty much map out equity returns off the back of it. I think at the moment, uh, Waverton's view on inflation is it is it's currently very high, and given year over year base effects, it's likely to moderate. But actually, so the moderation we expect over the next kind of six to 12 months to be quite, quite strong as the month on month comparisons roll out. But then actually going forward, we think it's going to likely to be structurally higher. And that structural support to inflation really is driven from two things in our mind. One, government's fiscal spending. COVID proved to governments the fiscal taps could be opened and are likely to continue to spend and support the economy and the population at all costs putting money into the hands of people. They've also announced huge infrastructure investment acts, whether it be in the US, Europe hasn't managed to agree it's one as per usual, but it likely will happen over the next kind of six months or so. And this fiscal spending should really support inflation going forward. And it's very different from the kind of monetary easing we've seen post the GFC. So we do think that dynamic has certainly changed in favor of supporting structurally higher inflation. And secondly, is really we've gone from kind of globalization to now kind of a complete and utter reversal of that. We're seeing onshoring, friendshoring, 
uh, where we're seeing manufacturing capabilities really in the US in particular coming back to um, the US or Mexico, which is really starting to skew the labor dynamic. And it's really labor which is ultimately going to drive core inflation, which is very sticky at the moment and not showing signs of wobbling yet on the kind of inflation front. So although forward looking indicators suggest we should see a weakening in employment coming forward, which may help ease that dynamic, as it stands today, we actually think there's a kind of structural shortage of labor and we really need to get that participation rate up in the US to get more um, employees back into workers back into the employment market, which should help ease that dynamic. But as it stands today, we really do feel like inflation is going to be kind of running at a structurally higher rate than it has done post the GFC era. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, I've had quite a few coming in. Um, are you worried about gearing in real assets? So, giving and um, basically the rising cost of debt. Yeah, that's certainly a really good point. And just want, want to kind of highlight this is very different dynamic to what we've seen since the GFC. I think in the GFC, we saw significant amounts of leverage within the real asset space. Uh, particularly property. And right now, actually, we think the LTVs on these kind of investment trusts and REITs is actually much more sustainable going forward. Yes, they are going to have to manage um, higher kind of interest rates going forward, but we do not think that's going to result in kind of significant covenant breaches, which result in fire sale of assets. What we could see here is a period where we see dividends cut because the dividends need to be cut to IE increase the um, amount paid to the borrowers. But there are other areas of real assets which are gonna benefit from this. So one area we're particularly bullish on at the moment is specialist lending, which is a direct beneficiary of higher rates. So it really talks about where you're investing within the real assets universe at different parts of the cycle. So we think right now, property is trading at a very attractive valuation given the discounts and now we've seen, but there may be a bit of dividend weakness coming but actually specialist lending is benefiting from these higher margins. They're, first of all, lots of their loans they're making are floating rate. Uh, and it's likely that actually going forward, they're gonna be making and deploying loans into the real estate market and infrastructure market at much more attractive levels, which will benefit their income. So um, yeah, I think there's definitely some cause for concern, but it's not, this is not kind of a GFC type era. And actually it could be very supportive for the specialist lending names and asset finance names. Um, okay, so and then on a similar, there's a similar question, which is how are high interest rates affecting how you guys value future cash flows? You know, that's probably changed things quite a bit, I would imagine. Yeah, no, so it's, it's definitely, definitely changed things a lot in the kind of last two two quarters. But what I think is really important to highlight here is that why are we getting higher interest rates? And we're getting higher interest rates because of higher inflation. Now, lots of the real asset investments we have, as I kind of demonstrated earlier, i.e. I, I positively rental income or revenue income is positively correlated to inflation or directly linked to it. So what we've seen so far and why we've seen kind of net asset values fall marginally and share prices fall materially more is actually just a repricing on the discount rate side. So we've seen that discount rate rise, which means your future cash flows ultimately when discounted back are lower. But what people we don't believe are taking into account is that the reason why discount rates are rising is because inflation's high. Inflation's higher means actually if you're in structurally supported areas where the supply demand balance is still likely to lead to more rental growth or you're going to get it just because your contracts are directly linked to inflation you need to filter that in so actually over the longer term we feel like yes interest rates are up but these trusts can have a positive nav and income story on top of that which will offset it the pain point came in kind of september is because of how swiftly we saw that repricing and if that repricing happened gradually over kind of a one two three year period the discounts would and the navs wouldn't, wouldn't have had to move as materially. So we still think actually from here, structurally, given the higher inflationary backdrop, uh, they are pretty well supported. Um, okay, so actually on that point, you, are you not worried for sort of demand, elasticity of demand coming into play there for some assets? So as in, even if, you, even if you're capable of raising prices with inflation, but just at a certain point, you, you cease to be able to do it? 
certainly so so that's why you've got to be very specific where you're taking your like where you're taking your exposures so you've got to be sure on that supply demand mismatch so that's why within the real assets fund itself or Alvin, we don't hold any office exposure because yes they may well have um, contracts over the next two to three years but they're not ever going to be able to achieve that rental growth because the companies are just going to say no i don't need the office space anymore because we've seen a big shift in the kind of move from work from home dynamic but where we do have exposure particularly on the kind of investment trust and REIT side is to areas where we think there is still a positive supply dynamic i.e logistics uh, bed sheds and meds is a great example where we actually still believe there's strong demand for these assets which will result in rental growth where we see an excess of supply i.e office and retail that's where we do not want exposure the broad commercial REITs we do are not constructive on and actually think they're value traps even if they're trading at kind of 40 percent discounts to navs but when you've got kind of logistic assets trading at 30 percent discounts 25 percent discounts to nav where they're still seeing really strong demand for the assets we think there's very attractive returns from there going forward particularly as they're still getting kind of anywhere between five to ten percent rental growth I think that's an area that's really interesting at the moment. So um, hopefully that also um, answers the next question we got in. So uh, <laughs> thanks to whoever asked that, but hopefully you're covered there. Um, there's a, a, a bit of a different one on, I suppose, of um, portfolio construction. And the best, I guess the best way of summarizing it is if you're someone who is investing for long term, uh, you're prepared to write out volatility. Is it actually worth constructing your portfolio in this way? So I think if you looked just, I suppose it might be referring to the, um, the, the graph you showed with the S&P 500 versus, versus one of the managed futures. Uh, okay, yeah. Oh, what is well, that? And so, so essentially, like, it, it's, it's obviously a positive that when the S&P performs badly, awesome, yeah. managed futures goes up. But in the long run, you're still actually doing quite well um, yeah. just holding the S&P. So... I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. So, no, definitely. If you're truly a kind of long, long term investor, you've got a 15, 20 year horizon. I just say you should pretty much stay invested in equities at all times. You don't need to build a multi asset portfolio. But if you don't have that sort of time horizon to to kind of play with you, that's when you've really got to start considering kind of fixed income and then alternatives. So we definitely kind of, there's definitely a delicate band between fixed income and alternatives. And actually in our portfolios right now, we've gone neutral to overweight fixed income because we kind of see growth slowing significantly over 2023 and inflation moderating. But then say, let's say fixed income has a 10% rally from here, which is possible. Let's say the US Treasury yields at 3.5% duration of eight it kind of falls to 2.5% yield. That's a kind of 8% return in your US Treasury 10 year, 10 year government bond. But then you're back in that 2.5% yield region. Yet actually structurally going forward, we think inflation is going to be higher. So therefore you're just going to lock in losing money if you're going to invest in that over the next 10 years. So that's where you've really got to consider alternatives. And then that's when you've got to think, where are we in the cycle? And do I want to be invested in real assets or absolute return? If there's significant risk out there maybe you want to have an overweight to your absolute return investments so then you've got ample kind of cash plus proxy that when real value shows itself in the real assets and equities you can rotate that capital out of your absolute return allocation into attractively valued real assets and equities but i would say at this moment in time given the discounts in offer within the investment trust space we actually see a lot of value in offering the real assets allocation at the moment and they're discounting a pretty bearish scenario so you actually think now could be a good time to be allocating within some risk assets as a house we are still quite nervous on equity um, really because we're not seeing valuations as attractive they're kind of x us they're kind of around long time averages with likely deterioration in growth over 2023 2024 those earnings numbers needs to come down so we really kind of feel right now the sweet spot is to be kind of neutral fixed income because you could see a capital growth return over them but then you need to be very actively allocate that into absolute return alternatives and real asset alternatives where we think there's selective value unless equity markets decline significantly from here and then i would definitely suggest that's when you need to be going overweight equities 
Um, I think there's a question on um, bonds. Uh, how are you positioning or how are you thinking about your portfolios at the short end of the yield curve? Uh, are you investing in short duration zero to five year bonds? I don't know if you can answer that. But... Yeah, yeah, de definitely can answer that. And actually, within the multi asset funds and the absolute return fund itself, and, and Waverton as a house really are taking advantage of that kind of short, short duration that short term exposure to fixed income, whether it even just be in the US government um, or in the government market or the credit market. And we actually think right now there's a really good opportunity set within uh, short dated credit. We're talking investment grade credit here with one year duration and you can get a kind of pull to par yield of 6.5%. We think that's uh, very attractive, uh, particularly when you're in that investment grade space where this is large large corporates issuing these bonds and can really actually just pay off this debt without refinancing or having to raise further capital it's just part of their usual cash flow metrics so we really think that's an attractive opportunity and we're taking advantage of that not only in the absolute return fund but also broad multi-asset funds and then we are also within the multi-asset funds taking advantage of the significant yield available from money market funds right now and that's definitely a competing um, asset right now cash you can get return from it and whilst there isn't significant value in equities and yields are kind of let's say moderately government bonds are moderately valued we think cash is is almost arguably a kind of happy home over the very short term but then as soon as an opportunity presents itself we really need to be taking advantage uh, of it because ultimately cash is just going to get eroded by structurally higher inflation going forward yeah. Uh, so there's there's another question which is basically on thinking about portfolio construction. Um, so I suppose with your, one of your prior answers when you talked about how old you are, sort of influence basically influences how you should think about things. Uh, so I suppose it's difficult to give a, a specific answer to this. But in broad terms, how how would you go about thinking about constructing a portfolio that has these three elements that you've talked about? I don't know if they mean like specific percentages or something like that. But. Yeah, so, so, so the best example I can kind of give you right now is specific percentages is the Waverton Multi-Asset Income Fund, which is kind of run by James Mee, who's the lead manager, and I'm the number two on, currently has about 45% exposure to equities. And we've had that as high as 60, well, 58% is the highest we've ever got. And the lowest we've ever got in the last five years is 42%. So I think it's fair to say we're kind of underweight equity exposure. What we've done recently is kind of bring down that alternative exposure and increase our fixed income exposure, because actually now, particularly two weeks ago, before we saw the banking crisis with yields around that 4% mark, we thought were very attractive. We've been the beneficiary of that yields as prices, bonds, prices of bonds have risen. We're now kind of considering other options. The other thing we're using actively within the fund is cash. As I said, we've kind of been very active on the asset allocation point. We've had cash as low as five, and it's currently at around 13%. So we are very defensively positioned, and we'll look for kind of opportunities to allocate to distressed real assets and distressed equities when that kind of pricing is um, and the valuation is there. So it all really comes down to what kind of valuation is on offer. We never want to be kind of really paying up excessively, particularly for fixed income, which is meant to be a risk-free asset, which can then bring significant volatility if we don't think we're being kind of awarded uh, for that risk. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, the, you, again, another thing you talked about is, um, or you, you mentioned quite a few times in the, in the, the talk was basically quite, I suppose bearish on UK fixed income. I think, or that might maybe that was fixed income as a whole. Uh, yeah, yeah. Can you talk about some of the reasoning behind that? Is that just because of inflation? Yeah. So the so definitely with within the talk, I was kind of very bearish fixed income up until 2021, and then of course over 2022 we saw the UK gilt sell off north of 20. percent So that took your yield if you invested in 2021 at 0 0.5 percent. Up until present day, if you were to invest in it now, you kind of get a three to three and a half percent yield. So obviously, a three and a half percent yield is much more attractive than it was at your um, at your zero point five. But the reason why we're slightly opportunistically bullish fixed income at the moment is because in an environment where we see slowing growth, we think that yield could come back down. 
but then you're going to have to trade it very opportunistically because once that yields back down let's say it gets sub three percent two point five percent again the valuation is starting to look rich yet we actually don't think we're going back to a regime has it has been the last 10 years i.e very low inflation around the kind of one to two percent mark if inflation is structurally higher let's say two to three percent the 2.5 percent yield on your uk gilt isn't giving you a real return which is ultimately there's no there's no point in investing in it so you, that's why you've really got to kind of look at these things relative to inflation over the longer term so short term view yes bullish fixed income but then is that where you want to be structurally positioned on a kind of five-year view arguably not because your um returns just going to be eroded away by inflation yeah so do a, a couple more um one is um i think your talk and, and even just what you've said in your past answer uh, illustrates that markets can be quite dynamic and and nothing is really fixed right i think if you look over the past decade there was this idea we'll have low rates forever tech is going to be going up forever all that sort of stuff um, <laughs> Yeah, that's not the case. So, um, how do you, I suppose, how do you be proactive in responding to changes that were kind of large scale changes that you, we've arguably seen in, say, the past 12 months? And is there any risk there of you end up chasing returns and just not just sit staying in something and writing it out for the long run? Yeah, you've, you've, so there's kind of like there's the technical side and then there's like the fundamental side. So I think on the fundamental side, just putting my alternatives hat on, you've really, as I kind of spoke to, got to make sure the kind of supply and demand balance is in your favor, i.e. there is a significant demand for the assets. They're going to achieve rental growth or income growth um, versus the supply coming on board. Whereas I think office office is clearly oversupplied given the kind of change in dynamic so i think they're going to be very they're going to really struggle to get the rental growth so i think that supply dynamic on the fundamental side is is really important but then on the desk we kind of for the more broader kind of macro framework we we use a kind of four key pillars which we review on like on a weekly and then monthly basis to kind of point us in the directions of kind of where the market and the economy is facing and, and those are firstly liquidity Liquidity is a very good kind of leading indicator on where economic growth and inflation is going. So we monitor that. And actually, if you look at liquidity right now, it suggests we should have for the first time, I think, since uh, 1930s is actually year over year negative M2 liquidity, which since um, the Great Depression in 1930s. So it kind of gives us an indication of where economic growth should be going going forward and inflation, i.e. there tends to be a very tight correlation between inflation and liquidity and that liquidity has just dropped off a cliff so there could be a case to make the inflation comes down very swiftly the second pillar we look at is growth and if you look at growth other leading economic indicators your pmis your new orders to inventory levels all point to a significant slowing in economic growth over the next kind of 12 months everyone says our oh, employment is very um is very strong still inflation's still up there but unemployment and inflation are historically lagging indicators at the moment we're kind of at the coincident indicator point and we're just starting to see coincident indicators start to roll over job quits rates are rolling over which shows we could actually see some loosening in the employment market over the kind of next 6 to 12 months which makes us bear us on the growth element then there's inflation what do we think is going to happen with inflation um, as I've said, the year over year, structurally, we think it's going to be higher going forward because of the fiscal spending we've seen from governments and the onshoring. But actually, I still think it could roll over quite significantly over the next six to 12 months. And then finally, rates, because rates are going to give you the kind of valuation that's appropriate for the rest of your risk asset classes. And right now, yes, rates are, or in the US, they're now pricing five cuts at the back end over the next kind of, well, five cuts up until December this year, no more price hikes. And we don't think that's going to happen because we, we think the Fed is kind of stuck on its inflation mandate and is likely to keep rates higher until inflation is completely and utterly dealt with. Inflation is a lagging indicator, which is going to result in economic stresses. So I think those are the four things that we kind of review on a weekly and monthly basis to check if our kind of broad macro signals are changing. And, and right now it kind of does point to kind of bearish outlook particularly for the equity on the equity side of things and that's why we are allowed to be kind of allowing ourselves to be 
kind of short-term bullish uh, fixed income. Okay, well, to finish off, we can have a more uh, sales-oriented uh, answer, which is if someone's interested in accessing the Waverton portfolio, how would uh, they actually ask, can it be accessed as an investment trust? I think the answer is no, right? Or am I wrong? Unfortunately, we've been trying to work on the investment trust, uh, but haven't quite managed to get there that. So maybe one day in the future. But now, if you want to invest in the Waverton portfolio, there's um, four funds, all of which are on your usual uh, platforms. I think they're across 22 UK platforms, including the kind of retail ones, Hargreaves and the likes of that. So it's Waverton multi asset Income Fund. That's really trying to kind of achieve a CPI plus 3% like return across the cycle uh, and pay a healthy yield alongside it. And then there's the Waverton Portfolio Fund, which is your classic growth fund with a circa, let's say, 60 to 80% in equities and the remainder filled up of fixed income. Um, and that's also on Hargreaves Lansdowne. And if you're really focused on the alternative investments, uh, there's the Waverton Absolute Return Fund and the Waverton Real Assets Fund. Amazing. Well, there you go. Uh, Matt, thanks very much for doing this. That was uh, really interesting and, and a really good uh, really good talk and Q&A at the end as well. So hopefully everyone watching, you found that useful. Um, so yeah, hopefully we'll chat again soon. Awesome. Thank you very much, David. Speak soon. Peace.